Welcome back to 3 Plus U. My wife, whenever she hears me snore, she says she loves it because she thinks I'm getting great sleep. Turns out, maybe not so much. Dr. Vimal Ramji with the Chattanooga Heart Institute of CHI Memorial is here, and uh, we're talking about sleep apnea, and one of the, uh, I guess, byproducts, side effects, whatever, is snoring. Sleep apnea, we all know, is not good, but what exactly is it, doctor? Right, so sleep apnea is a uh, sleep-related breathing disorder. Uh, that's characterized by increased episodes of uh, reduced air intake during sleep. And that's caused by obstruction of the upper airways. And we say that snoring is one result of that. And a lot of people think that if you're snoring, that's just overall bad in general. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are certain signs to look for in somebody that snores. What are those? Yeah, that's exactly right. So there are a number of symptoms that may provide key clues to care providers as to the presence of sleep apnea. And uh, some of those symptoms include excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, restless sleep. And then as you mentioned, loud snoring or, or frequent snoring is one of those clues. Typically a, a partner will recognize um, their spouse uh, having snored a lot and then having periods of actual complete silence where no air is going in. Uh, between those uh, loud snoring uh, periods. And I think a lot of spouses can, can recognize that. They'll have that spouse that's, that's just sitting there snoring like crazy and all right. of a sudden they're quiet. And when they're quiet, uh, you'll look over to make sure they're okay and then you'll get that <gasps> and, and the person starts snoring again and the other yes. person relaxes. But right. that's when they need to get checked out, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And what's happening there is that uh, they're actually overcoming that obstruction in the upper airway during that period of silence and then it's finally hitting a threshold, threshold where the airway is opening and they're getting a whole uh, a huge intake of air. And that's that noise that uh, partners will often hear and, and bring up in, in the clinic. Well, let's talk about sleep apnea and how it can be harmful. Why would we care if we have sleep apnea? Sure, and so uh, a lot of research and work has come out uh, over the past many years showing that sleep apnea has multitude of effects in, on the body, a number of which are important for the cardiovascular system. And so um, because there's a reduced intake of air, we have lower oxygen levels in the blood and higher levels of carbon dioxide. We're not exchanging gas as we normally would during those sleeping hours with sleep apnea. Because of that, a number of sensors in the body are set off in a sense, and, and that results in an increase in the heart rate, an increase in the blood pressure, as well as an increase in the sympathetic nervous system activity, which is just basically to say that you're kind of revved up uh, all around, and that results in a number of cardiovascular effects, including hypertension, you can get arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation is a common arrhythmia associated with sleep apnea, as well as uh, other risk factors like diabetes can result uh, from uh, having sleep apnea or at least have been associated with it strongly. So while it may not be something that affects you tomorrow, this is something that it sounds like has uh, build up over a long term of some pretty nasty stuff that can cause a heart attack? Uh, what are some other things that can happen? Right, no, that's absolutely right. And so um, I don't know that I would pin it directly to a heart attack, but we do know that folks who have sleep apnea actually have an increased risk of dying from any cause, but they also have an increased risk of having cardiovascular events in general, and those certainly do include heart events, heart attacks down the road. And you're right in saying that it's more of a long-term uh, sort of effect of the condition, but uh, that's not to say that there aren't short-term issues as well. And um, like I said, the heart rate, the blood pressure all fluctuate dramatically during those sleeping hours every night. And I think it's the repetitive insults uh, that results in those increased deaths and, and increased cardiovascular morbidity from sleep apnea. And, and even in the short term, as in tomorrow, if you're not getting a good night's sleep, you're just not going to function as, as well. That's absolutely right. And so I think we can all empathize with that. Um, I think, uh, you know, folks who have sleep apnea typically will have uh, more pronounced symptoms, including uh, morning headaches, uh, significant daytime sleepiness, and then very restless sleep. Um, and uh, those can very much be resolved with adequate treatment. Well, let's talk about the treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned a clinic earlier. What's the first thing somebody's listening and, you know, it's been kind of cute because of the loud snoring and right. people make fun of them because of the sure. loud snoring. Uh, now they're starting to take it a little more seriously. Right. What's step number one they need to do to get treatment for this? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, it comes down to having a care provider who has that suspicion of the presence of sleep apnea. Uh, once a patient comes into uh, the office and has any of those symptoms, uh, the first step is really to order a sleep study, uh, which we refer to as a polysomnography. 
and uh, that can be done in the hospital and that's basically the gold standard. Uh, there are newer uh, methods to actually complete that in the home setting for people who are unable to come to the hospital. And what's done is you basically go to sleep and uh, a bunch of monitors will uh, record the number of respiratory disturbances you have per hour and quantify that. And I bet a lot of people would be totally surprised at how many respiratory disturbances they have in a night, aren't they? That's right, yeah. And so I think uh, it's a great test because it gives us a huge, uh, it gives us a big picture idea as to whether the patient is sleeping well, and if not, uh, how many respiratory disturbances they're having. Should people start with their general practitioner or just go straight to the hospital and say, I want to set this up, I want to study this? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the key is to convey to the care provider what symptoms they're experiencing. Uh, from our end, uh, we use that alongside uh, any risk factors that the patient might have, for instance, if they're obese. If they have other risk factors, being a man, uh, you're two to three times more likely to have it. Uh, having a smoking um, a history or currently smoking. Um, as well as having uh, conditions specifically like uh, heart failure or renal disease, which are at high risk. Well, so let's give people some help. Let's give them information. Yeah. It's Dr. Vimal Ramji, yeah. the cardiologist with the, say it? The Chattanooga Heart Institute. Chattanooga Heart Institute, part of CHI Memorial. Yeah. There you go. And uh, give us a phone number, uh, maybe a website where people can get in touch with you. Sure. It's uh, chattanoogaheart.com would be the best way to get us online. All right, you got it. Doctor, thank you so much. We are back. More 3 Plus U. Now take a nap, sleep, rest easy. We're back right after this.